How would you describe uh, the Soviet Union as a country in the terms that they treated sex? What kind of country it was? I think there were three, three main ways of, uh, three main spheres of sex. There was the official sphere, and during Stalin times and not long after, there was the official um, description of what sex should be. And we know exactly, it should be two minutes, once per week, and no longer. And it should be between a man and a woman in marriage. Full stop. This was the official sex. Then we have the sort of sex of the ordinary people. And I would say that probably it resembles sex anywhere else in the world. We're animals and people, many people had normal sex lives, um, maybe not a lot of sexual education, but still they had no complaints, people we've talked to. Okay. And then there's the third category. And that's the category that I would call Soviet sex. That's the category where the strictures of totalitarianism entered into people's lives. And that is where all of the pain and lies and evil ma manifested itself. And that is, was seen everywhere from prohibitions against homosexuality, uh, against abortions, um, lots of different problems at different, in different decades, depending on, uh, on, on where you were and at what time you were, what time you were living in. People were afraid. People were afraid that if they did something wrong in their career, they would be accused of a sexual crime that they didn't even commit by a neighbor who wanted their apartment. On the other hand, people were able to commit sexual crimes as long as they were a powerful member of the party. They could rape young girls, and it happened very often, even here in small towns in, in Ukraine. And that's what I think of as the, the, the evil, the dark side of Soviet sex. And really, it's what happens under totalitarianism, when there's no free press, when then there's no free courts. When someone is raped, there's nowhere to turn. Okay, you just said that there was no uh, sexual education and uh, uh, why do you think it was such a taboo in the Soviet times? Why sex was such a taboo? Why was it such a you know, repressed subject, repressed topic? I think that there's a relationship between how free a society is and how freely it speaks about sex. And the less free the society, the more, of course, the more control that the government wants to have over every individual. And in a totalitarian society, the deepest form of control, this is the subject of Orwell, is the, the bedroom and, and even your unconscious thoughts and your desires. And so in the Soviet Union, sex was so highly controlled that people, people were afraid to even speak about it because maybe they might say something wrong or maybe their words could be used against them. Um, or maybe, uh, you know, maybe, the, well, we know that teachers weren't allowed uh, to speak about uh, sexual education. The hero of our film tried to get schools in Vinitsa and across uh, Ukraine to teach about sexual education because he was seeing already 14, 15 year old girls and boys with sexual diseases. And he was seeing young girls who were pregnant and coming and saying, but I didn't kiss, I didn't kiss him while we were in so bed. The, the, yeah, I don't understand why I get pregnant. Yeah. Exactly, so he, Dr. Michael Stern, he saw the suffering that this closed society created and he tried to open, he tried to open it up. He failed, of course, and ended up in jail. But for me, for me and for the people working on our film, he's, uh, he's a hero because he was trying to fight against a totalitarian system that made sex a taboo. And instead, to speak about it closer to how we speak about it today. Okay, you just mentioned it. Uh, you just said uh, about this uh, people who, after the revolution, they said that uh, 
we want to have the sexual freedom. So, and I know that you researched uh, the Soviet Union, how uh, the treatment of sex uh, changed during the times. So can you tell about that? How did it change actually? Yeah, this was something that I, hadn't, I didn't know about. Um, and that was that the revolution was not only a revolution in politics and, uh, and in economics, it was a sexual revolution as well. And there were some, it was a, a crazy time. There were uh, parades down with virginity. Virginity was considered to be a bourgeois concept. And so in schools, 17, 18 year old kids were organized to, to march against virginity. Um, in one small, one small town, in several small towns, there was an idea that all, all uh, boys and girls should register. And if they don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they can choose from a list, have sex, just like drinking a glass of water, yeah. as uh, Alexandra Kalantai yeah. put it. So there's been a long history throughout time of people going into this extreme um, sexual, sexual openness. Um, and so in Russia, it took, it, it took the form of um, women and boys, but mostly women, were pressured into having sex because if they said no, it was a sign that they didn't support the ideals of communism. Okay. They weren't sharing uh, themselves. And that was used against mostly women. And within a few years, this kind of phase died out. Now, in 1933, all of this openness towards sexuality was completely closed by Stalin. And Why do you think it happened? I think Stalin wanted order. Stalin wanted to control the citizens in every way. He also um, realized that in order to build a big army and uh, lots of workers, you need marriage and no birth control and no abortion and lots of babies. And um, so I think he did everything that he could to, to, to create those, those circumstances. But I also think that he had a sick fear of the non-traditional, which... Was there a kind of sexual revolution in the Soviet Union? You know? Well, certainly, certainly there's the Stalinist era, which is tied up with the war era, which was tied up with sexual atrocities committed, um, again, mostly against women, both by German troops, Russian troops. This was a, a decade uh, plus of sexual horror, which I think left a, a, a wound on the Soviet uh, mind, the Soviet psyche, up until the late 50s or early 60s. I think that by the 60s, after Stalin had died, and there was the beginnings of some thaw, um, there was a little, bit, a little bit more openness. And I discovered that starting from the 60s, there was a serious, large-scale program to find young boys and girls, swallows and ravens, they were called, and um, recruit them into the KGB, train them in how... First, they had to train them in sex. So, ironically, one of the few places in the Soviet Union... Where can you learn something about sex was KGB? was, yes, so in school they didn't teach you about sex, but if a, the KGB thought you could be a good sex spy, the first thing they did, they brought 100 students into a class, and we know this from several memoirs of uh, one in particular of a woman who was able to escape, and she's uh, in our film, uh, in, in one of our reconstructions. They took 100, 200 students, and they showed them pornography, and most of them were totally freaked out, but that's how they, that's how they introduced them to sex. And they talked about sex openly. Again, probably nowhere else in the Soviet Union were people talking about this as openly. And then they actually had these students watch people have sex, and then they themselves had to have sex with uh, either other students or visiting army cadets. And they would, according to uh, the memoir of our hero, the army cadets, these young boys, 17, 18, 19, were, their job was to say no. Girls had to seduce them. 
and the best, there were up to 10,000 sex spies working in Moscow, uh, Petersburg, across uh, Eastern Europe, and in places like London, um, Paris, throughout the world. And they were extremely successful. In fact, there was a special branch of sex spy. It was a 40, 50 year old man who focused on the secretaries of important NATO uh, strategists, generals, colonels in uh, Eastern Europe and in, in, and in Western Europe. And these male, um, these male spies would find the secretaries who mostly were uh, either widowed or didn't have husbands. They pretended to fall in love with them. Many cases they actually married them for many years and asked them to start to bring home materials from their boss. And when the Cold War ended and the wall fell and the, and the archives were opened, they realized that almost, well, the Soviet, the Soviet Union knew everything that NATO was doing, everything that NATO was planning, and almost half of the secretaries, the, the older ones without husbands, were sleeping with or married to or having affairs with Russian or Soviet male sex spies. So, so until this day, uh, the programs continue.